weapon unused is a useless weapon. It's Soulfinger by the Barquets. They must be having trouble getting gigs. That's an SS-50 long-range rocket and mobile launcher. You know what those things can do? Suck the paint off your house and give your family a permanent orange afro. <laughs> Bounce pulse failed to connect with target, sir. Where did the pulse go? Wow. Excellent. The significance of that will be obvious a little bit later. Um, <clears throat> as Gunnar mentioned, I'm currently contracting at the Weather Channel. Um, I have a corporation called Zavax, and it's basically... Um, I do consulting in the daytime and tinker with uh, supercomputer designs at night. And so that's why this is sort of a passion of mine, concurrency and parallelism. Um, <clears throat> just prior to the Weather Channel, I worked on two other projects. One was uh, collecting um, electric meter data over the internet, and the other was collecting gas meter data over the internet. So they're very similar projects. Both of those involve big data. Obviously we do big data at uh, the Weather Channel. It's just not typical big data. So I thought I had, when I was at ADP, I thought I understood what a lot of web traffic was because we had like uh, 40 million users on our portal. But most of those users go in, enter their time for the day, and then they're gone. That's it. Um, <clears throat> I'm currently working on a project at Weather Channel, um, a gateway to do authentication and metering of our APIs that our goal is to, is to service a billion um, RESTful service hits a day. This is a pretty tall order. Um, <clears throat> so needless to say, we have to scale. Our concurrency has to scale to just uh, ridiculous, what, what would seem to me six months ago to be ridiculous extremes. Is it? Okay then. Um, so I think the meeting notes said uh, I was talking about concurrency. I'm actually talking about concurrency and parallelism. What's the difference? They're related but different. A concurrent program deals with multiple threads of control. Parallel program executes different parts of a program in parallel. So I like the, I think Rob Pike here sums it up best. Concur concurrency is about dealing with lots of things at once. Parallelism is about doing lots of things at once. <clears throat> Some examples of concurrency. If you're the first bank teller in in the morning, you're probably processing the night's deposits. Uh, maybe you're the only teller there. And if customers walk in, you've got to interrupt what you're doing, remember your state, walk over, service the walk-in customer, then go back and remember what you was doing and pick up. Um, another example is um, <clears throat> teachers are, I hear they're the masters of multitasking. They might be uh, listening to one child read. Meanwhile, Johnny hits Susie with a spitball, so she's got to interrupt what she did, go over and establish or reestablish order in the classroom. So two concurrent examples. Parallel examples, um, multiple bank tellers, now we're processing transactions in parallel. Um, the teacher is joined by an assistant, so now maybe she continues listening to the child read while uh, the assistant goes and scolds the child. Um, all the children in the classroom taking an examination, that would be another uh, example of parallelism. Uh, so why master concurrency? I probably don't have to tell you guys this, but first of all, you don't have a choice. The real world's concurrent. Um, you can achieve higher performance because fewer of your processor resources are sitting blocked, waiting on um, a lot to, uh, you know, to proceed. <clears throat> uh, you create a more responsive application. Uh, your user is not waiting on you to, 
you know, service some other transaction. Uh, it en enables resilience. You, if your application is designed for concurrency, it's a whole lot easier to make the leap to now we're going to detect that uh, <clears throat> one of these modules is no longer behaving properly. I'm going to kill it off and inject a different one. <clears throat> uh, a current current program can easily become a parallel program, and that's becoming ever more important. This little thing has, I think, four cores, eight if you count virtual cores. A lot of the uh, Xeon-based desktops I see now, some of them have 16 cores on them. So you have the potential to run things in parallel. Maybe you don't normally think of your desktop as a parallel computer, but it is. <clears throat> and the other reason is synchronous programming just doesn't scale. Um, it starts out looking tempting when it's an extremely simple project. And as you can probably tell, I'm a pretty old guy. Back when I started in my career, we didn't have much choice. Some of the first hardware I worked on, little microprocessor boards that didn't even have a timer. So you had no choice but to write a loop, adjust the timing of the loop by sticking in no ops, ridiculous crap like that. And every part of the loop had to be working all together to make sure that it's all, that it's all working. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I, I can't remember how relieving how relieved I was when um, I got my first little scheduler working. When I finally got a 68000, which was a decent processor that could support, um, you know, more something more like a real-time kernel, to actually be able to just split things up into independent tasks. And yeah, I had to deal with concurrency, uh, but overall it was a big win. Can you pass my water up here? I'm getting dry. So what happens if you don't plan for concurrency? <clears throat> concurrency problems, difficult to detect. I mean, I'm talking like nightmare to detect. Um, because it might only happen one in a million or a billion transactions. So um, <clears throat> unless you just happen to have the right instrumentation at the exact moment that happens, you're not going to catch it. For the, some of the same reasons, it's difficult to reproduce because it's usually it's race conditions. Um, occurs at seemingly random times, and just that your bottlenecks result in wasted resources. We'll look at a, a couple of uh, map implementations later where you'll see the, uh, the performance of the map itself. It's like 20, 20 to 1, maybe. There aren't many things that we do where we get a chance to do a 20 to 1 improvement in performance of what we're doing. <clears throat> things you can do to mitigate concurrency problems. Uh, always synchronize access to your shared data. That doesn't necessarily mean using the synchronized keyword. We'll talk more about that later. Make your locks as granular as possible. Don't lock big objects. First of all, if you have big objects, maybe you should already be thinking about refactoring them into smaller, multiple smaller objects. But even if you did have a big object, only lock maybe the portion of it that you have to. A uh, common example might be an object might have a list of listeners hanging off of it. Um, you, maybe you only need to synchronize when you're modifying that list of listeners. <clears throat> um, minimize the time a lock is maintained. Um, <clears throat> Speaks for itself, I guess. Um, <clears throat> grouping unrelated data into separate objects is basically the same thing as making them granular. Um, avoiding alien methods. Anybody know what I mean by that? Um, <clears throat> if you've ever done like any swing programming or Java AWT programming, you know a lot of uh, widgets you had a, a listener hanging on to it and you could add listeners to it. And that's a pretty common pattern to be able to add visitors or listeners or whatever. Um, the problem is if you have locked code, you know, in other words, you're inside, say, a synchronized block, and then all of a sudden you start calling all the listeners that are on this list, you have no control. You have lost control 
of how long this thing's going to be locked. So <clears throat> you need to find another way to do that. Uh, possibly queue up the activity into a, maybe a separate thread or uh, make a snapshot copy of the list if it's short. Um, <clears throat> but bottom line, get in, and, get in and out of the lock as fast as you can. Um, this last point we'll talk about in a little bit more detail later, but acquiring multiple lots, you, you, you want to be very careful about the order which you acquire your lots. You can very easily uh, result in a deadlock. And by global order, what I mean is like, uh, typically it might be something uh, like a, a sequential integer ID that you've assigned to each object of that type, or um, Maybe in some languages you could just use the actual address of the object. Um, it doesn't really matter what it what it stands for, but it's just important that each each object has a unique value, and you use those values in ascending order. <laughs> this is the example of what I just talked about. You may have heard of the. Um, puzzle called uh, The Dining Philosophers. I couldn't find, uh, the, well, this was the best image I could find of it, and I don't know why, but they numbered them H1, H2, instead of P for philosopher. So I don't know why they did that, but, so I called it Dining Haberdashers. <laughs> but I, I, I couldn't find very many occupations that started with an H. Hairdresser, that's boring. So, haberdasher. Anyway, Here's the way this puzzle works, is that each one of these guys, they think for a while, that's why it's called dining philosophers, they think for a while, random amount of time, and then they maybe want to eat for a while. And this goes back and forth. Now, as you can see, there's only six chopsticks on the table and there's, there's six haberdashers. So, obviously, they can't all eat at the same time. Uh, so when one decides to eat, he needs to pick up both his left and his right chopstick so that he can now eat. The problem is, if you are not careful about the order in which you ask for locks, this might run for weeks even. Uh, but suddenly, your system will come to a halt because you finally just happens that each philosopher has already locked the chopstick maybe to his right, but he hasn't got a lock on the chopstick to his left yet. And the same thing is true of the next philosopher and the next one. Until you get all the way back around the circle, everybody's holding a lock on their right chopstick, but nobody can get a lock on their left chopstick because that the guy to their left has already got it. Is, is that clear? <laughs> all right, so this is why it's important to do these uh, chopsticks in global order because what will happen is when H6, haberdasher number six here, decides he wants to eat, he doesn't do it right first and then left. He tries to lock C1 first because that is the lowest ID in global order. And then he tries to, uh, to lock C6. So for the guy that's kind of like at the end of the circle, Everybody else is doing right then left, but he has to do left then right, and that breaks the, the cycle. And it eventually, everybody gets to eat and think. Is that all clear? It's kind of a weird puzzle. But this is something that you gotta think about in terms of when you have a lot of threads contending for a small number of resources, um, pools of connections, um, Anything that's got pools, you know, you're probably gonna, you're probably gonna run into this. <clears throat> okay, so since we're AJUG, I'm gonna talk mostly about concurrency in Java. <clears throat> so threads are your basic mechanism. It's usually pretty closely tied to the hardware. Uh, it provides a foundation for other frameworks that we'll talk about. Uh, you know, you can probably go years writing web applications and never really think that much about threads because 
the container's doing it all for you. Um, I probably, I guess I spent quite a few years in that, that mode, and then suddenly when you start having to manage threads yourself, it's a lot more complicated. Your basic hazards are uh, race conditions, multiple objects trying to read or modify the same object. Um, when, especially when you get multiple cores involved. Uh, but even on a single core processor, you'll have situations where two threads are trying to read, modify, write at the same time. The other problem is stale data due to memory visibility. I'll talk about what that means in a moment. Um, <coughs> The basic mechanism built into Java from, I guess, from the very beginning um, <coughs> was definitely in 1.4, is the, is the monitor that every, it's intrinsic to every object. Every object's got a monitor. Um, it's managed by the synchronized keyword. So uh, you either put synchronized on your method signature, um, but that's really just syntactic sugar for saying, synchronize this, and then the code that, that you want to synchronize. Um, this works fine in a lot of applications, but anytime you start dealing with higher levels of concurrency, and you know, higher is even single digits, it starts to be a problem. Um, you know, what we'll see in our map example later, the performance of the map starts to drop to the floor even when you've got two threads. Uh, so that's why I say it's suitable for limited concurrency. Uh, you're processing a lot of traffic, probably not. So the limitations on the on the lot, um, because of the way the synchronized keyword works, you have to lock and unlock in the same method uh, or in the same block of code that's surrounded by curly braces, <coughs> and. In a way, that's good because when you fall out of that block, the lock goes away. You don't explicitly say, unlock this monitor that I just got. It just, it just disappears. So that's kind of cool for simple situations. Um, <clears throat> but sometimes you might want to be able to lock in this method and then later on unlock in some other method. Um, there are a lot of cases we'll maybe talk about where you need to do that. Um, Multiple locks have to be nested, and that's simply because you have to contrive it so that um, a synchronized method on object A calls a synchronized method on object B and so on. Um, <clears throat> there's not a very convenient way, at least prior to the concurrency library, uh, uh, to <clears throat> gather up all your locks at once. Um, there's no timeout. Uh, well, first of all, threads, if, you're t if your thread is in the point where it's already asked for the lock, so you've already hit the line of code where you said synchronize, whatever, <clears throat> so you're already in the queue waiting for that lock. You can't be interrupted. And it's kind of surprising to me that, that uh, you, you almost have to kill the JVM, I think, to actually free up that thread. It's pretty much stuck forever. So that, that's um, a serious hazard if you only got a certain number of threads you can support on your box. Uh, there's also no timeout mechanism. I can't say, gee, I'd like to have a lock on this uh, connection here, uh, but I don't want to wait more than 30 seconds. You know, maybe after uh, 30 seconds, I want to just come back to the user and say, sorry, we're too busy, um, come back later, or whatever. <clears throat> don't just leave them hanging. Um, multiple locks, even if you have crafted them the way I described, by nesting calls to synchronized, uh, either nesting calls to synchronized methods or nesting synchronized blocks within a method, uh, you can still wind up uh, with uh, deadlocks. And again, it's because you don't quite have the, the precise control over when you obtain and, and release locks. <clears throat> the, uh, I don't think that was supposed to be on this slide. Uh, alien methods can cause reduced concurrency, uh, basically because if the listener example I was talking about earlier, uh, if you're off 
you know, who, who knows what that listener might be doing. It might be redrawing the whole screen. Um, everybody else who needs the use of this object is just sitting in the queue waiting. Uh, so your nice fancy 16 core server, 15 threads are waiting, one's doing some work. Not good. So here's um, an example of the race condition that I mentioned earlier. So this is, the, this is one of the main hazards about a thread. And is anybody who doesn't see the bug in this code? <laughs> In this case, uh, the increment method, this is the most glaring error. The increment method needs to be synchronized. Um, <clears throat> and if you run this, um, I mean, if you, if you cut and paste this code and run it on your desktop or laptop, you won't get the same answer twice. You would think, um, well, the driver that I had run this has two threads, so you would think it would be 20,000. You'd think that when this thing's done running, both of my counting threads have, you know, I've joined back into them, so they're, they're gone now. You'd think that the value of count would be 20,000, but it's not. And on my MacBook, running from the bash command line, um, I see numbers as low as 11,000. So a pretty large percentage of my increments to count got dropped on the floor. Why? <clears throat> the reason is because of the way this counter plus plus gets broken down into byte codes. Now, <clears throat> you don't really have to know byte codes to understand this. Basically, this first line is fetching the value of count. The second line says, I want to a constant value of one. The third line says do an integer addition. So now count and one have been added together. Line four is going to put count back into its memory location. <clears throat> this doesn't look like that big of an opening, but as my test proved, it happens, you know, something like 40% of the time, and that's just with two threads running. <clears throat> So what's important is synchronization makes sure that only one thread at a time is running these four lines of code because if two threads are in contention for this variable, thread one runs line one of code. Or maybe it's, it could be anywhere down into this first three lines. Thread two comes along, he also executes line one of that code. But now he just fetched a stale value, an the old value. And thread one is just about to write the incremented value back into counter. But moments after that, nanoseconds after that, thread two is going to clobber that value with essentially the same value. If, if it started out, counter was five, thread one reads five from the field, he starts to add one to it, Thread two also reads five from the field because maybe he interrupts somewhere between line one and line four. Now they're both going to add. They're both going to write six when the real answer should be the correct answer should be seven. <clears throat> so this fixes uh, that problem in the about the easiest way possible by using the synchronized keyword. Now only one one thread at a time can be in this, thing, in this uh, increment method. There's still, does everybody think that fixes it? There's still a little problem lingering here. We'll talk about it in a moment. <clears throat> I see this a lot, and it's very tempting. I mean, most people consider, you know, lazy initialization is usually considered a good thing, usually considered an optimization. In a multi-threaded environment, this isn't thread safe. <clears throat> um, two threads calling get builder for the first time. They both check to see if builder is null. They both fall into the if statement and decide, hey, I need to allocate a builder. Um, <clears throat> and then 
you know, basically one builder gets wasted. I mean, it'll eventually get garbage collected. If it um, has other resources tied to it, I mean, we don't know what this initialized builder code following the new statement does, but um, <clears throat> I, I suppose it could be possible that it could be, it could get like, you know, inserted in a list or, or uh, it might have some viable resource attached to it that we would want that to be cleaned up immediately. <clears throat> but um, that's only one of the failure modes of this little piece of code. Um, the other failure mode, which could be even really more serious, because uh, odds are the memory wasted by one of these builders uh, may not be that much. It's probably going to get garbage collected. But the other failure mode is thread one comes in, he hits the if statement, he decides, I need to build, I need to create a new builder. And he's already written it into the, the instance variable builder. Thread two comes through and says, oh, builder, it's not null anymore. I can start using it. But we haven't executed whatever this code here where it says initialize builder. This maybe hasn't been executed yet. So this builder could be in an unknown state. So, you know, you can't always do everything with constructor. You could have put some extra parameters in your uh, constructor call uh, and maybe guaranteed that you never return from new until you had a completely initialized object. But you can't always do that. So this just isn't thread safe. <coughs> this is um, a bad way to try to fix that problem. And it happens a lot uh, because it seems so plausible. Um, <coughs> we Actually, I don't think that volatile keyword's supposed to be there. That's in the next. Sorry, guys. Pretend that volatile keyword's not there. Sorry. I cut and pasted too sloppily. Um, <coughs> so, uh, again, the build builder is a private variable, a, a private member variable. We fall into get builder. We check to see if the builder's null. It's null. So we synchronize on this object, and then we check to see if it's null again. This is what the double check refers to, is we're going to check to see if the builder is null again, and then we're going to go ahead and create it and initialize it. Doesn't work. It's not thread safe. Um, gosh, forget all the reasons this doesn't work. There's a, uh, diatribes about this, and, and that's why they call it an anti-pattern. There's diatribes about the evils of this on, on the web. So if you if you Google double check locking, you'll you'll get a near full, I guarantee. Just just as a isn't this the case that the reason it's not thread safe is because the builder can start construction and then the thread will get switched out before it finishes construction and does the assignment? Oh yeah. You rattle my memory there. Um, because of the way the Java memory model works. <clears throat> We could, we could assign to builder, but the, another thread may not see that value yet. Is that what you're saying? I, I think I've got another slide that describes it in a little more detail. Um, this is actually a fairly decent solution to that. The volatile keyword basically tells the Java memory model every read from this variable has to show the last write to that variable. So the compiler, it's basically telling the compiler, no monkey business, don't reorder my instructions, don't reorder my assignments, don't optimize anything out, just do it in strict program order. And that's why this works in the other example did. Any questions on that so far? Um, <clears throat> And this, uh, this example actually uh, highlights what Summer and I were just talking about. Um, simple little class that has a, a Boolean telling me if the answer has been initialized. Then it's got the answer itself. 
And so my first thread, T1, when he runs, he's going to set the answer to 42. Everybody knows that's the universal answer, right? 42. And then he sets answer ready equal to true, telling the rest of the world, he thinks, hey, you know, we're ready for you to use this value. Now, this is the other half of the program. I can fit this all on one page. Um, thread two, he's real simple. He's, he's basically just going to check for if the answer is ready. He's going to print the line with the, he's going to say the answer is whatever. Uh, else he's going to say, I don't know. Now, what do you think is going to happen uh, if I run, if I create both these threads, start them, what do you think is going to print out? Anybody want to guess? <laughs> All of the above, actually. Um, <clears throat> if thread T1 runs first, the answer is going to be 42. If thread T2 runs first, let's back up to him. See, if he checks the variable answer ready, notice he's not in any kind of loop here, so he's only going to check it one time. Not a good idea, but this is just an example. So uh, if the answer is ready, he's going to print the answer, else he's going to say, I don't know. So if thread 2 ran first, he's going to say, I don't know. At least that's what we think it should do. And 99.99999% of the time, that it's going to do one of those two. And it's probably going to say 42, because when you start a thread, and then you try to start a second thread, the first thread you start is probably going to get first crack at the processor. But there's no guarantee of that, and you shouldn't depend on that. But how the heck does it ever come up zero? For that to happen, when thread one runs, he writes answer first, sets it to 42, then he writes answer ready equals to true. Problem is, the Java spec specifically allows them to play games with your code. The compiler can statically optimize your code by reordering. The JVM can dynamically optimize your code by reordering. Um, and I, you know, I was kind of surprised by this when I started reading more about the Java memory model. I was kind of thinking, yeah, they, they can't be, what were they thinking, you know? But um, these things enable some of the performance enhancements is, is the bottom line of it. And even within the hardware, um, your processor will, almost all modern uh, processors, um, I think anything in the core series, any of the Xeons, um, everything pretty much in the power, power family, PowerPC and IBM R6000, all of these, um, they do, they execute instructions out of order uh, if there are no data hazards. Now, I think the hardware guys do a little better job of this because they will make sure that the visible artic artifacts in memory, when another processor or another core looks at memory, it will appear as if things happened in program order. But J Java doesn't give you that guarantee. So this is what they call memory visibility in the, in the Java memory model. It only guarantees inner thread memory visibility in the following cases. And by memory visibility, I mean another thread now sees what you just did in this thread. Or another processor in a symmetric multiprocessing system sees what you did uh, in this other thread. <clears throat> so how do we guarantee it? Uh, releasing an intrinsic lock, like when you exit out of a synchronized method or you ex exit out of a synchronized block, you're guaranteed that anything that happened before you release the lock is visible to anything that runs after you release the lock. <clears throat> um, volatile is a special case, basically. It's synchronizing just the, the reads and writes to a specific variable. He's saying, don't reorder things regarding this variable, because he's volatile. Uh, there are quite a few thread operations that result in synchronization. By the way, synchronization in this context, when I say 
uh, writing synchronizes. Uh, this basically means synchronization with regard to the memory model, not the synchronized keyword itself. But um, <clears throat> with threads, you're guaranteed that uh, when, a, when you call thread.start, anything that happens that happened in your code before that is visible <clears throat> after T1 start in my other example. So um, <clears throat> the Java, the compiler and the JVM can never reorder these things such that you did something before you hit start and then the thread starts running, maybe it gives it priority first and it somehow doesn't see some of the things that you've just written. And the same three things true on the on the back door when you join with a task, everything that happened before you join with that task is guaranteed to be synchronized and visible in your thread after you exit from the join call. Um, all that clear so far? Um, if you look up the J Java SE uh, specification, go to section at least the version that I looked at was section 17.4. Anyway, it's called memory model. Um, <clears throat> it'll make your head hurt, but read that for more details than you ever wanted to know about how the Java memory model works. <clears throat> the concurrent library came along, I think, with Java 5. Uh, <clears throat> it gives us a lot of great tools to work with. Better locking, better synchronous. There, these things now called synchronization bears are similar, but not quite the same as as locks. Um, you, there's a bunch of high performance thread safe containers uh, in this library. Most of them have the word concurrent in the name, like concurrent hash map. Um, I think there's a concurrent tree map. I don't know all of them, but uh, there's almost certainly a container out there that does what you need to do in a concurrent thread safe manner and they're they're not just simply thread safe they're high performance in the face of multiple threads lots of threads um, so I mean it's easy to slap the synchronized keyword on everything um, in fact you can take any, almost any of the containers that were in the old Java util like a hash map you can wrap it with synchronized map. Suddenly, it's as if every method on hash map was synchronized. Um, so that's a simple solution to be thread safe, but the performance sucks. <clears throat> okay, so we get better thread management. There's some. Um, um, well, the the um, interface is called executor, but you, it, it's easy to, for instance, build a pool of worker threads that will read jobs from a queue and then go off and run those threads. I mean, a lot of that's just you know, completely automated for you. Um, futures, uh, if you use some of the other languages, even languages that run on the JVM, you might have ran into this before. Future, I think of it kind of like a, kind of like a proxy that uh, is holding some way of getting in touch with uh, the answer when the answer is available. Uh, but for right now, you're just holding this object that's pointing to nothing. And so later on, was, the way you would use this is you say, um, hey, go off and run this task and immediately return me a future and I'm going to forget about it. And then at some later time, the task that gave you that future is going to write the answer into it. So only when you really get to the point where, oh, I need this answer. I've been doing my other process in parallel all this time. But now I actually need this answer to proceed. Then I go to that future and I can, I can check to see, is the answer there yet? I can block waiting for the answer to be there. Um, so it, it kind of decouples uh, things for you. <clears throat> there are traditional semaphores in, uh, in uh, the concurrent library. And another thing that's pretty convenient, because this is one situation where you see a lot of synchronization happening, is uh, counters. 
you need um, atomic counters. Uh, by atomic, I mean the, the incrementing of the counter has to happen atomically, one, one operation. No other thread can, uh, can intervene. <clears throat> so, uh, oh, do you remember off the top of your head what some of those classes are? It's like atomic long, yeah, stuff like, like long, long, yeah. Atomic yeah, you get the idea. So if you, for instance, uh, you might have had a singleton long, uh, a static long in your class that just, you know, you incremented that long every time you created a new object of that type and that became its ID. Um, that doesn't work. Well, singleton in general has problems in multiple threads, but that specifically won't work very well in multiple threads because you can have two threads creating objects at the exact same time both of them, the, the counter example we showed earlier, that's what will happen, is they'll, you'll wind up with two objects with the same ID. Not good. These atomic classes, like atomic law, uh, you basically call a method. Well, you, you've already created the atomic law. It's an object. It's not a name. And so you, you call a method on the atomic law, and you say, uh, it's basically, the, I think the method is called get and increment, or it's something along those lines. So what this method is going to do is it's going to return you the old value, but it's going to add whatever number you passed it as a parameter. So, you, you know, you can increment by two, by four, whatever you want. Well, typically for me, one. But, uh, and you don't have to worry about anybody else who calls atomic long just to get the value of atomic long. They're going to, it's going to be thread safe. They're going to they're going to see the next value. And if they also called uh, get an increment, they'll be guaranteed to get one higher than what you called. Uh, the value you got is going to be one more because it can't, it's atomic, it cannot access it until your operation has finished. Sorry for all the hand waving. Um, <clears throat> Reentrant locks, these are basically uh, the behavior is fairly similar to the built-in locks, the intrinsic locks, um, but they can span method boundaries. You can create, you, you explicitly create the lock. Intrinsic locks are, they're intrinsic. Every object has, has this monitor. Uh, but you can create a reentrant lock in your code, and you can then call lock in this method, and then later on call unlock in another method. In fact, a common example I've seen is um, I've got some queue. I'm shoving stuff into the queue. All of a sudden, I get a call to put something else into the queue, but the queue's full. Lock it. <clears throat> then nobody else can proceed with the code to shove more stuff in the queue that's already full until later on, somebody calls the get on that queue and creates an empty slot in the queue by removing one of the elements. So now there's space, and so when you unlock it, the first guy waiting on that lock gets a shot. So now he gets to run. Um, <clears throat> you can do fairness, and this is something that there's not a, I don't think there's much of a guarantee of fairness with intrinsic locks, but with a reentrant lock, this will cost you a little bit in performance, but you can say, when I wake up these threads, they will be woken in the exact order that they asked for the lock. So if thread three, seven, nine ask for the lock in that order, they're guaranteed that the that three will be in line first, seven will be in line next, and so <clears throat> Oh, this is... Uh, how big it? You can interrupt. You can interrupt the calls to get the lock. You can ask for the lock, but give it a timeout. So I'm willing to block, but I don't want to wait more than, say, 50 milliseconds. So after 50 milliseconds, you'll get, you know, it'll return an error. This is one of my favorite from the, from the uh, concurrent package, concurrent hash map. Functions mostly like a hash map, there is one minor, well, I consider it a minor difference. Hash map will let you put nulls. 
in the map, it will let you put null keys, it will let you put null values, I think. Concurrent hash map doesn't allow that. Usually not a problem. Part of the reason for that is some of the methods that uh, that it has, um, you, <coughs> you have the option to get, ask for something from the hash table and block, uh, or ask to put something in the hash table and block, but you also have the option to um, immediately get an error value if it, you know, if you can't put, if it's locked and you can't put something in the hash map. Um, <coughs> basically, the way, one, one reason I like this is it kind of demonstrates uh, the, the benefits of having a very granular lock. Each of these little sections here, um, by the way, when you create a concurrent hash map, you can specify what it calls the level of concurrency. Uh, so two neat things about hash, this concurrent hash map. Reads almost never block. There's only a few things that you can do, things that like make huge global changes to the hash map that would cause you to block. Most of the time, if the only thing that's going on is gets and puts, the gets will never block with concurrent hash map. That's cool. Um, the puts, what it does with that concurrency level is under the hood, it actually creates what amounts to, uh, in this case, 16 little hash maps. Now, if you go look at the code, it calls these segments, they're hash maps. Uh, so basically what he's doing here is he's peeling off the bottom four digits of the key. It's eight. And so he indexes into his array of segments and says, oh, I only want to lock segment eight. So meanwhile, if another thread wants to put something that the key ends in zero or the key ends in three, he locks zero. He don't care about the guy who's got the lock on eight. He doesn't care about the guy who's got the lock on three. Um, it's not perfect. I mean, you only get 16 possible concurrent updates running at the same time if it just so happens that your key space, to, you know, just happens to map out that way. Two people try to do, two threads try to do a put at the same time. Both the keys end in eight. The second thread's going to have to wait on this guy because he's, he's already going to lock segment eight and do his put. Um, <coughs> but as we'll see in a second, it, it makes a, a huge difference. Um, And this is an example of a huge difference. When I first looked at this, I thought um, you can see that the normalized throughput on concurrent hash map, look at that, 64 threads. That's a lot of threads. Um, is three times the performance of a synchronized hash map. But no, not really, because synchronized hash map's performance, you know, just basically drops through the floor with only two threads. So by the time we get out here to 32 or 64 threads, it's really more like um, 15 or 30 times the performance. Um, so this is what I was referring to earlier. Very few times do I see an opportunity um, to make a 15 or 20 to 1 improvement in something. Even if it's only, you know, just concerning this, this particular map. Um, <coughs> But one of the situations I ran into at the Weather Channel, um, we have a facility called Forecast on Demand. It calculates 15 days worth of forecast. So what you get back is an enormous JSON that has 15 days, 30 day parts, 12 hour, 60 intraday, which is uh, six hour, and then 372 hourly forecasts. That maybe sounds a little ridiculous, but it's, what it's actually doing is it's calculating 372 hours in the future, and then it starts rolling those up. So six hours sort of get rolled up into a, six hourly forecast gets rolled up into an intraday, and then those get rolled up into the day parts, which get rolled up into the daily. Uh, <clears throat> but we have customers, in fact, one internal uh, customers with their underground who want all that data. I have no idea what they want to do with it, but 
you know, give them what they ask for. Um, <clears throat> so this is an expensive calculation. I think uh, even initially it was running about 200 milliseconds per request, uh, but there were some really long outliers where, I don't know, for whatever reason, every now and then, maybe it takes two seconds to run. Not good. Um, <clears throat> so we put a, a cache in front of this. In fact, uh, it's one of the main functions of our uh, outbound API server is just getting this forecast on demand when we need it, when we don't get a cache hit. Breaking it down into pieces, saving it in a cache. We're using Redis. Uh, but we also have a, a what's some, sometimes called a near side cache or a local cache. So um, <clears throat> a lot of times that's a big benefit because um, there are composite requests where maybe they ask for all the dailies and all the hourlies. Uh, well, while I've got those in memory, I just wrote them to Redis. It would be a shame if I had to go read them back from Redis before I could service this guy because I already had it in memory. So that's what our local cache does. Um, but it was um, originally not performing well when we went to load testing uh, because the guy who implemented it was uh, uh, careless and just used a synchronized hash map. Uh, I think his name was Phil Harvison. Uh, anyway, uh, one of my coworkers schooled me on, hey man, you gotta use concurrent hash map. Uh, and, and to be honest, I had never really used much in the concurrent uh, Java util concurrent. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, just, you know, it's like a, somebody flipped a switch and suddenly, uh, it's like in a Christmas vacation when they switch on the auxiliary nuclear power. Holy crap, things started working a whole lot faster. Um, <clears throat> so anyway. Um, this is another common source of contention is resource pooling. And uh, <clears throat> you have to do it because, uh, for instance, for database connections, if you had to open an Oracle database connection every time you wanted to do a CRUD operation, it would be extremely slow. Uh, I had a coworker who made that mistake once. Uh, he, wh when I called a method to persist a list of objects, he basically just wrote a method to persist one object, and that method that persists one object connected to Oracle, did its thing, did its create, then dropped the connection, and then it returned, and so then it went through the next iteration. And so when we had cases like where we were getting 100 objects, and oh, that's pretty common when you have a, a uh, list widget on your screen where you know, maybe you got a list of accounts or um, <clears throat> a list of uh, line items in an invoice. So there's any number of places where you have lots of applications, I mean, lo lots of items. And in this particular case, it was a, uh, kind of an inventory for applications. It basically kept track of all the custom applications that um, this company, uh, an unnamed communication company, uh, had. Uh, if you've ever worked in any of these data comm companies, you know that they have a lot of custom software just because of the nature of their business. So anyway, uh, this list could very easily return three, 400 items and <clears throat> it would take minutes to run. Uh, I mean, like, I think I'll go get coffee now, minutes, you know, like 15 minutes for this stupid thing to run. Uh, all this time, we're trying to give the user half a second response time. Not going to happen if it takes you 15 minutes to fetch the list. So you gotta re you got to have resource pools. <clears throat> and... Uh, the problem is it invariably means that uh, you're going to have to synchronize on whatever container is is being used to implement that pool. Um, having a resource pool is another good reason to uh, to have these is 
if you recycle a small set of objects rather than creating a new one every time you need, the second approach, you're going to do more garbage collection. Depending on your garbage collector, you may or may not pause while that happens. Um, <clears throat> so it, it injects a lot of indeterminates into your program because you, know, you never know at some random time in your program the garbage collector suddenly decides, I need to, I need to run. I need to clean up. Um, <clears throat> so that's another good reason to use resource pools. Uh, problems with resource pools, uh, they can waste resources. If you, if you don't uh, intelligently size the pool, if you, know, if you just made it 10,000 or something and you were never going to use more than 10, that would, be, that would be a big waste of memory. Uh, resource pools, the way they're often implemented, they don't allocate the resources fairly. The first person in line to get it isn't guaranteed to be the first person who actually does get it. He might have been waiting longer, but you give it to the thread, you give it to another thread um, <clears throat> who hasn't been waiting as long. Um, <clears throat> I think we've already covered this last bullet. You, you know, you're, because you are locking on something inside the pool manager, uh, you're probably going to create bottlenecks. The concurrent library uh, helps us out again. Uh, blocking queue is an interface, but there are, uh, much like you have a list and array list, there are implementations for the most common uh, types of queues that you might expect. Um, <clears throat> so it's an interface for blocking queues. Um, methods can, uh, they can block, they can block with a timeout, they can return a special value that basically it's saying, I couldn't, I couldn't give you a resource, so I'm going to give you null. This is one reason you can't put nulls into the container. Um, in the case of puts, uh, if you call the version a put that returns with a special value, it's going to return you a Boolean saying, did it work or did it not? True, it put, false, there was no room in the queue. Um, <clears throat> so all these implementations, all the implementations of blocking queue that are in Java Util concurrent are thread safe. Your mileage may vary. Um, you know, if you implement your own blocking queue, you need to do it in the spirit of the contract that that blocking queue has, you know, there's there's nobody making you do that. I guess is what it boils down to. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I haven't found too many cases, with one exception, where I wanted to implement my own blocking queue. Um, also, with queues, they can implement fairness. So, but you can say um, strict ordering of whoever asked for the, whoever did a get and blocked first gets the first thing off the queue as soon as it's available. Second guy in line gets the second object available off the queue. Um, this is just a real simple little class I threw together. Um, it's certainly not the best way to do a concurrent pool, but it fit on one screen, so that's why I did it this way. Uh, so, so basically, concurrent pool is using a blocking queue underneath to do the real work. And so, when I create my pool, I'm passing in an array of whatever resource it is that I want to manage. Um, so, it's a it's an array of type T called elements. And so, uh, whatever the size of that is, I create my array blocking queue. This is a implementation of blocking queue that stores its data in an array. It's very, it's very efficient, but it needs to be fixed size, I believe. Um, <clears throat> so the, the size, the first parameter, that second parameter true is telling the array blocking queue, I want fairness. Uh, the, the parameter is actually called fairness, so I'm telling them true, I want fairness. So then I add all my elements to the queue. So when I first start up, my queue is going to be full of size number of elements. And thereafter, anytime somebody calls acquire, they're going to take one off the queue, 
that's going to block if there's nothing to take. Um, <clears throat> and then later, when they're through using that resource, they call this release. It adds it to the queue. Uh, theoretically, that should never block because the queue was big enough to hold size number of elements. Uh, so there should always be room unless somebody's inventing new elements and call and release with it, which would be a really dumb thing to do, but hey, it happens. Any questions on this? Um, this is the one thing I want that um, I haven't really seen exactly what I want in the concurrent library is a, a fully concurrent list that's um, a linked list, so it it's not necessarily bounded. It could be you know, theoretically infinite in size. And I want to only lock the elements that I'm playing with. And they call that hand over hand locking. So as I'm traversing this list, I first lock the first element in the list, then I lock the second element in the list. Now that I've got those two elements locked, the links between those can't be manipulated by anybody else. So <clears throat> the previous node for this second node in the, in the list is still going to be what was the first node. Uh, and that's probably the only one I care about. Um, then when I want to move forward, I release that lock on the first element in the list. I, make a lock, or I, I ask for a lock on the third element in the list. And so uh, this is basically what I'm doing is I'm inchworming down. That's why they call it hand over hand locking. Um, <clears throat> now, let's say that uh, one neat thing about this is that there could be thousands of nodes in this in this list, um, and it's a linked list as opposed to the queues that we talked about earlier. Then the reason the queues are a little bit simpler is you're always either adding to the tail or reading from the head. Or maybe it's the other way around. I don't remember. But anyway, you're always dealing with the endpoints. You're not going into the middle of the list and pulling out an element. You, you can, but that's one of those situations when uh, you probably shouldn't have used blocking queue in the first place because your performance is going to take a nosedive. <clears throat> but um, in this particular case, um, and the reason, by the way, I want to do this is I'd like to implement a uh, least recently used cache, and that means somehow I've got to keep an ordered list of whoever, every time you hit the cache, you go to the back of the line. So you'll be the last person to be cast out if I for some reason have to throw things out of the cache. So that's why I want to do it. But as more things get moved to the end of the list, you move further down the list, but now somebody accesses you again, I want to pull you out of that linked list break your links, and then move you back to the back of the line again. So, um, does everybody understand why you would want to do that? Um, <clears throat> in the case of hand over hand locking, um, let's say that I, I'm traversing the list, and I'm, do, I'm calling a comparator, and T2, the, the second node in that list, which I've currently got locked, is less than the object I'm trying to insert. I've got, a, I've got a lock on T3, but he's greater than the object that I'm trying to insert. So I found the place I need to do my insertion. And because I have both of these objects locked, I can break the forward and backward pointers. I can wire up this new node. And so now there's a T2B that's sitting between T2 and T3. Then when I release the locks, uh, nobody else was the wiser. <clears throat> uh, extracting is a little bit more complicated because you basically you have to have three locks. But it's still, it's hand over hand locking. You, if, if you know that's, because you, you know you're in a remove method, you know that that's your goal is to remove an object from this list. <clears throat> You've in this last bottom case, you've locked T2, you've locked T3, and T3 matches your key, or you know it's equal. 
So this is the guy I want to remove from the list. Now I need to also go ahead and lock T4, then break T3 out of the list, which I can do because I own 2 and 4, and then rewire T2 and T4 to point to each other. And so and this is kind of cool because, um, I mean, the naive implementations that you see of this basically lock the whole list. So if I've got a thousand items in my list, uh, which is a very likely scenario for what I was trying to do, a, a least recently used cache chain, um, <clears throat> and I have lots of concurrent threads hitting this cache, it would really suck if I had to lock the entire list for the time it takes me to go in there and do that. Uh, and, and it's not, well, the traversal to find the element, first of all, could take a whole event amount of time. Um, so it's indeterminate, so that's not good. Um, <clears throat> but even if somehow I was always just knew exactly which node to go to somehow, um, I would still need to lock the entire list and just synchronizing on an object. It, I've seen cases where like that section of code maybe takes a 10 to 1 drop in performance, just the time it takes to lock. It, have you seen that kind of result summers? I know you've done I mean, I don't really do that much with uh, concurrent linked lists. Actually, I was going to ask about, um, let's say you have you know a list of a million elements. Mm -hmm. And you're doing, you know, hand over hand locking, and you have let's call it a thousand threads, wailing on it, adding, removing, reordering nodes. Mm -hmm. um, what do you do when you start ending up? Wouldn't that cause a lot of memory fragmentation? Where, <coughs> you know, you've got very, you know, you've got all this memory, and then things are just like stretching out as objects get created. And... Well. A linked list with a million elements is not going to be a good thing, no matter how you slice it. Yeah. But, <clears throat> but it would only magnify the performance increase from doing it this way because if I've got a million things in this list, odds are I've also got a lot of threads trying to access things in this list. And so that would just be a bigger choke point. Whereas if I have, I could have 16 different threads traversing this long list of a million elements. And um, each thread only cares about one, two, or three nodes in sequence. And it always gets the first node first, and then it gets the second node, and then if it's doing a removal, it might get the lock on the third. But it releases the first lock, keeps the second one, and then it inchworms up, basically. So that can be happening all up and down this chain. Large numbers of threads. Uh, oh, and one of the tricks here is <coughs> it helps if you make your head and tail pointer a node. So you know, just keep track of the fact that, oh, this node's special. If he's pointing to himself, my queue's empty. Um, but it kind of simplifies the plumbing. And you just get a lock on that node like you would any of these other nodes. And now you've got the ability to modify the head or the tail pointer. Um, oh, I think I see your point though. If you removed the, like I had earlier, I had locks on T2, 3, and 4. If I remove 3, um, I believe that if I don't set those next and previous pointers to null, that can cause my garbage collector to think that it's still part of some, yeah. you know, some larger memory graph, and you don't want that. So, yeah, nulling out your pointers, probably, most likely, the way I'm using this is I'm immediately going to take it off of this queue, and I'm going to use that node to put it on another queue. So they're not going to stay uh, nulled out for long anyway. But, uh, yeah, if you've got a million items in your list, you're probably already looking at, well, I need a different data structure. This is not cutting it. Yeah, right. Uh, which most of my examples tonight are contrived, I'll freely admit that. Uh, any other? A better idea might actually be like a buffer where you have this very long segment of memory and you have multiple threads whacking into it, moving things in and out and around. Kind of like how Emacs works, right? I mean, yeah. Sort of. Yeah, sort of. 
under the hood anyway. Um, <clears throat> so that was the last slide I had on the concurrent library. How am I doing on time? I need to rock because I'm not going to get to the fun stuff. Um, it sure would be neat if all this thread management was taken care of for you. Uh, a common way to do that is to use uh, um, actors, a framework called actors. And uh, actors, they enable both concurrent and parallel execution because everything is message passing. Uh, very many of you used actors. Maybe you're programming in Scala. Um, what are some other? Haskell, I think, Scala, does actors. Uh, um, Anyway, there, there's a bunch of languages out there that, that actually have the syntactic sugar to make actors extremely easy to use because they have, like, Scala, for instance, lets you overload operators. So they got an operator overloaded that says, send this message to that actor. <clears throat> but we're a jug, and so you might want to use actors in Java. Well, there's a plethora of competing frameworks. I don't know why there's so many. Probably the one you've heard the most about might be Akka. Am I pronouncing that right? Akka? Akka, whatever. A-K-K-A. -A. Um, I, I looked on Wikipedia for um, actor in there. I, I think I, I stopped counting when I got to about eight different frameworks that ran on Java. And then there's a bunch of others that run on the JVM because it's like, you know, it's what Scala's doing or Haskell's doing or Clojure's doing. Um, <clears throat> so neat things about actors. Uh, they, they, at least they should not ever share state with other actors. Uh, right off the bat, that means no thread contention for, fair, uh, for shared memory because nothing's shared. Um, an actor can create other actors. They only communicate with other actors by sending and receiving messages. Um, Usually an actor spends most of his time looping, waiting for the next message, or doing something in response to that message. That, that's really about the only way anything happens. And as I mentioned, so there's some native support, and then there's some library support for Java. Uh, <clears throat> so messages, at least with actors, uh, they're sent to an actor's mailbox. And um, this mailbox, you could think of it kind of like... Uh, a synchronous message queue. You're, you're guaranteed that the actor will see, receive messages in the order they were added to the mailbox uh, unless the actor specifically says skip a message or look, I think you can look for a message of a certain type like a, the, if you were, say like if you were a bank account actor, you might look for the next message that's a deposit. Um, Messages can be synchronous or asynchronous. They highly discourage synchronous messages. And, um, the, the difference is asynchronous, it's fire and forget. I send, actor A sends a message to actor B. He doesn't wait around for the results. Somehow, actor B is, he, it's, it's, it's his baby from that point on. A synchronous message, you can basically say, I want to wait around for a reply. So what happens is a message gets sent back to you. And you could do this on your own. You could, at some later time, have B send an, a message back to A. Uh, because when you sent B the message, one of the things he gets in the message is who it came from, the, the idea of who it came from. So at some later time, he could easily send a message back there. But they do have synchronous messages, which basically means uh, A would block until B replies. And replies go to the front of the chain, I believe. It's like um, they're kind of an exception to the mailbox being strictly first in, first out. If it's a reply, it goes to the head of the line because A is blocked waiting on it. So there's really no other way to do that. <clears throat> I ran across this interesting quote. Uh, this is from Alan Kay. Everybody know who Alan Kay is? He's the guy that invented small talk or he designed it. He didn't actually implement it, but he's the guy that basically came up with small talk uh, at Xerox Park. <clears throat> and he says, I'm sorry that I long ago coined the term objects for this topic because it gets many people focused on the lesser ideal. The big ideal is messaging. 
The key in making great growable systems is much more to design how its modules communicate rather than what their internal properties and behavior should be. And you know, that's something that we've probably been taught all of our professional life, I would hope, um, is concentrate on the API, not the details of how the internals of the object are implemented. Because if you get the API right, if it's a well-designed API, the rest is it's details. <clears throat> Important details, but um, if, if on the other hand you focus first on uh, implementing individual little pieces, you'll find that you're going to constantly have to come back and re-implement that piece because you didn't get the API right the first time. No guarantee that you'll get the API right if you think about it first, but at least you got a fighting chance. Um, <clears throat> so actors can and usually do run in separate threads. Um, there's minimal thread contention because, as we said, there's no state shared. Um, the only thing in an actor-based system that has to be synchronized from the way we describe synchronization is the message queue itself. And that's really not too big a deal, but it's because there's thousands of actors probably in your system, tens of thousands of actors maybe. Um, these are pretty lightweight things. They're somewhere, they're heavier than, well, you would think of them as being a fairly heavy Java object, but definitely way lighter than a thread. <clears throat> so there may be you know, thousands or ten thousands of actors in your system, and you're only synchronizing when one actor tries to write to a second actor's queue. So unless for some reason 999,000 of your actors are all writing to this one guy, it can happen, but that's to be avoided. So unless they're all doing that, there's not going to be a lot of contention. More than likely, you know, actors are just talking to random, well, not random, but, you know, they're, they've got this small uh, group of peers that they exchange messages with. Um, <coughs> oh, and they only stall while they're waiting for the next message or if you do the synchronous messages we mentioned earlier. Uh, because of this, they can also run on, in parallel on multiple cores. They can run on uh, multiple processors in a sym symmetric multiprocessor. If you've got like a, the Mac Pro, for instance, it's got two Xeons. Uh, you know, messages can bounce back and forth uh, between threads running in the two different processors. Um, <coughs> actors can also run on any processor in a distributed system if your framework supports this notion of a, a remote address. So you can say, I want to send the message to this actor with a specific ID, but he's at 10.2. whatever, you know, your internet address. Um, <clears throat> so that's not supported by all frameworks, and the way it's supported is not um, the same across the board. So your mileage may vary on that one, but you're definitely a leg up. If you've, if you've built your system in terms of actors, it's pretty easy uh, for you to go from this in-memory message queue to a message queue that's across a network. Maybe the underlying mechanism uses something like RabbitMQ or uh, IBM MQ series if you really love the pain. Um, <clears throat> but can you see, does everyone see how this basically makes your entire system um, less, with less thread contention so more things can happen in parallel? Questions? <coughs> this is a real simple actor example. The, um, I just picked pretty much a framework <laughs> at random. This one is from IBM, but uh, don't laugh, it's open source. And uh, it's, uh, they, call it, they call it micro Java actors. And it's a little different from some of the others. Um, you know, like I said, most of the time actors are sitting in a loop. With micro Java actors, you don't actually have to write the loop. It's kind of interesting because you actually do write it, I believe, in Scala. I think you actually write the, the while loop. And um, well, there's another language where 
you actually, oh, I think that maybe it's closure where you have to call yourself again and it does uh, tail recursion, elimination, whatever that is. Uh, <coughs> but with micro Java actors, the loop's actually outside in the, in the base class, in its loop method. And so it's calling your loop body method every time it gets a message and it's passing you in the message. So a lot of it, that's kind of some work already done for you. Uh, so in this case, I'm saying, uh, what's the subject of this message I just got? By the way, that sleeper one is just in there for, uh, I stole this example, most of it anyway. And that's just in there to uh, cause some synthetic delay so that this thing just doesn't run boss of the wall all the time. Uh, but it gets the subject to the message and it says, uh, is this a repeat message? And if, the, if it is a repeat message, well, I don't implement any other messages, so it's going to be thrown on the floor. But if it's a repeat message, um, I get the data from this, uh, I get the data from this message, and it's, um, uh, you know, we've agreed in advance that what the format of our message is, what parameters are included in the message. So this meth mes method is saying, repeat some count number of times. Um, <clears throat> so I check to see if count is greater than zero. I create a default message. I make the subject to the default message repeat. I set the count to count minus one. Um, creating a, I forget why I'm doing this two name. Uh, oh, uh, I'm sending it to another actor. Um, <clears throat> I'm, to be honest, I'm not entirely sure that's that's uh, in other words, that's framework specific. That you can just uh, assume that actor with some integer tacked onto it is out there somewhere. Uh, so don't read too much into that. But <clears throat> uh, well, he he is though basing it on this external called uh, this constant called test actor count. So I guess yeah, he probably does know because of the way this program was crafted that he's only going to have a certain number of actors. So anyway, what, the, what he gets to down here is he, he gets that actor and then he tells the manager to send this message I just created, default message. From this, I'm the actor that's sending and two is the actor that I just got the uh, handle to. Um, so you see what this thing is actually going to do? It is, let's say I call actor one and I say uh, count ten. He's going to randomly throw this to one of the other nine actors in the pool. That guy's going to decrement count. So eventually the count gets decremented. This is a silly example, but it kind of gives you an, uh, an idea of um, the strategy that they use to avoid contention. i got to move. Now the fun stuff. Um, part of the reason I am so enthralled with parallel processing um, I'm from the uh, University of Alabama in Huntsville, and uh, some of you probably know Huntsville is home of Marshall Space Flight Center, um, but it's also home of uh, Army Missile Command, and specifically, all the ballistic missile defense stuff happens in Huntsville. And uh, <clears throat> at the time I was a freshman in college, I started reading about parallel processing. And one of the most interesting parallel processors that had been built as of that date, which would have been 1978, um, was a thing called Pepe. It's not Pepe Le Pew. It's not the soccer player. Parallel Element Processing Ensemble. This is one of the first true SIMD machines ever built. Single instruction, multiple data. And <clears throat> remember the shooting down the warhead thing we were looking at earlier? Pepe was all about shooting down incoming warheads. Uh, this thing here called DH uh, is the downlink host, and that is telemetry coming in from sources like radar saying, I saw a nuclear missile coming in at this coordinate. And <clears throat> so he assigns it to one of these processing elements. And there's this other guy, UH, uplink host is saying, 
um, from you know these processing elements get assigned a warhead. They start tracking it. They start interpolating where is he going to be next so that they get an idea of his track. And the uplink tells these missiles how to travel to intercept with that warhead. Everybody with me so far? Now, uh, Pepe actually got built. The system of which it was a part of, which was called Safeguard, um, never got too far off the ground, never got fully implemented. Part of the reason was, uh, and I think it was 1972, President Nixon signed the ABM Treaty that said, uh, we won't build anti-ballistic missiles if you won't build anti-ballistic missiles. So it's the uh, uh, guaranteed mutual destruction strategy. Uh, so it probably did save both countries a lot of money. Um, I've heard that called the uh, Pee Wee Herman uh, rubber glue approach. What bounces off of me sticks to you? No Pee Wee Herman fans here. Uh, but you know, basically, I I'm not going to send twelve thousand warheads at you because I know that before they land, you're going to send twelve thousand at me. You guys probably all saw war games, I'm sure. Uh, <clears throat> Nothing like that ever happened, as far as we know. Um, a few things about Pepe: 288 processing elements. Uh, it was implemented in ECL, that's a meter couple of logic. That, in that day, was the hottest thing on the market, uh, figurative, figuratively and literally. Um, had a 100 nanosecond cycle time on the ALU. Um, to put that in perspective, this was uh, I think the design on this started in like uh, around 69 or 70, 1970. Uh, back in those days, most microprocessors took a microsecond at the very minimum. Well, there weren't many around, for one thing. Uh, but, you know, like the 8080 when it came out, you know, you basically were lucky to get one instruction executed per microsecond. Uh, actually, it's slower than that because it could only read one byte of an instruction in a microsecond. So if your instruction was three bytes long, right off the bat, you're taking three microseconds. So this is smoking compared to the other logic and the other microprocessors of those days. <clears throat> it was also hot literally in the sense that I work with this stuff some, and uh, if you touched it, you could burn yourself, quite, quite literally. And... People used to joke about the uh, uh, getting a bat wing tattoo. Uh, Motorola, which is now free scale, but back then Motorola was one of the major manufacturers of this ECL logic. And their logo, you know, was the bat wings. And so when you touch these things, for some reason, sometimes the tattoo that, the burn that you would get, not a tattoo, but the burn that you would get would have the bat wing on it. I don't know why, but. Maybe the paint was an insulator or something. I don't know. Anyway, you, you, you would see a lot of technicians would be sporting bat wing tattoos. It's pretty crazy. Um, we're, we're, by the way, we're, we're lucky that we, well, Pepe was built, and it was kind of a groundbreaker of its time. And you don't probably think too much about single instruction, multiple data these days. By the way, the reason it's single instruction, I didn't draw it, but there's a, a control unit that's telling each of the execution units what instruction to run. So they're all running the same thing in lockstep. And it used associative memory. And somehow the algorithm was crafted so that all these execution units were running in lockstep, but they were working on different data. Each one was tracking a different missile. All right, so it did get built. And I, one of the reasons I'm fascinated with this is I actually got to see it. And in fact, one of my professors worked on Pepe. And so it's pretty cool to actually get, go over and see this, what at the time was a, a revolutionary secret computer. By the way, the reason they built this thing, uh, initially DH and UH were going to be uh, CDC 7600s. Those are the fastest computers of the day. This was before Seymour Cray left CDC and started his own company. 
so the last machine he designed at CDC was the 7600. And it was the no holds barred the fastest supercomputer of its day. I actually got to see one of those in Huntsville too, and it was pretty cool. It was like uh, you could actually walk inside it because there's a U-shaped cabinet. Uh, and there's a good reason for that. But, it, but anyway, it's a U-shaped cabinet with blue plexiglass that covered the, the wire wrap. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with wire wrapping, but basically um, for each pin on your chip, there would be, um, the, the socket would have a long tail like pin on it, and you would wrap, you know, there's a little tool that would wrap a piece of wire around that, and then you would string the wire over to wherever you wanted to connect that circuit, and the tool would uh, wrap that. It's actually how I got my tooth uh, chipped. At, at one time, I had the perfect size gap to strip the, the insulation off a of wire wrap wire. Uh, it's, it's called Canar. Um, I guess that's a type of plastic or maybe a brand. Uh, but it's very thin because none, none of the wires in these circuits are carrying a lot of current, so they don't get hot. Um, <clears throat> so quite often you could really use three hands. So it really sucks to have to drop one of the things that you're holding on to to reach over here and get the wire strippers and strip piece of the wire off so that you could wrap it around the pin. So I would just pull it and uh, it worked great for years. One day somebody handed me a spool of Teflon coated wire. <laughs> you know the rest of the story. Um, <clears throat> but it's actually good that Safeguard never got implemented. Um, Sprint was the missile that this thing was supposed to be steering. Um, it was a nuclear kill. So um, they actually thought um, the, the idea was to guide the sprint missile, the interceptor in their term, to close to the target, but it didn't have to hit it. And as it got close to the target, a small nuclear explosion would be set off. And you could actually knock out, you know, possibly multiple warheads with one hit. This was before anybody realized or, or understood electromagnetic pulse. So if you've ever seen like the, the uh, TV series Dark Angel, you know that nuclear explosions going off in your atmosphere, not a good idea. Nuke all your, well you don't nuke, but the electromagnetic pulse will blow out, you know, circuitry for a very wide radius. Uh, so we're lucky that they never built this. Also, they quickly, um, both the Soviets and the United States, uh, quickly came up with uh, what they call MERV technology, multiple independent reentry vehicle. vehicle. So uh, the, last, uh, the last ICBM that they built, I forget the name of it, but the, the last one that the United States built was called the MX missile. Both of those carried 10 warheads. So the missile reaches apogee, and then the top comes off, and 10 little warheads come out, each targeting Atlanta, Smyrna, where you know, they probably wouldn't target Smyrna. Maybe not. Uh, so, well, the point is, we were going to be overwhelmed. You know, we're, you're not going to get 100% kill rate. We're probably not going to install uh, 12 to 15,000 sprint silos in North Dakota, so it just wasn't going to happen. <coughs> um, so modern... Uh, Modern and parallel processors. Um, Peppy sounds like an odd duck. Single instruction, multiple data, but that's actually probably in, in uh, every graphics controller of every PC or Mac that you guys own, unless your PC is like 20 years old maybe. Uh, because that's typically what the geometry pipeline does. It's, ex it's operating on vectors. Uh, one of the key computations in graphics is to multiply this one by four vector times all these, this long list of one by four vectors that make up a drawing. And by doing that, multiplied by the right, right vector, you rotate, you translate, you scale. Um, <clears throat> so that's, a, that's actually what's going on in your car. Uh, symmetric multiprocessors, if you got like a Mac Pro, you probably even got one of those sitting on your desk. Um, there are, uh, well, 
Opteron servers, Xeon servers, a lot of those typically have uh, at least two processors. Some of the Opterons have up to eight processors. Um, <clears throat> but they're symmetric, M meaning that uh, processor one can see processor two's memory and vice versa. Uh, we have loosely coupled clusters. This would be kind of like uh, the Linux cluster that you might build within your own company or uh, Amazon, uh, Amazon Web Services where you're basically your cluster is in the cloud. Uh, tightly coupled clusters basically means you got a, a pretty fast communication path. The example here I give is BlueGene. Um, oh, I forgot the, the bandwidth uh, between processors on BlueGene, but it's in the hundreds of gigabytes per second. So it completely blows away uh, Ethernet, InfiniBand, RapidIO, any of the other things we're going to talk about. Wireless infrastructure, uh, believe it or not, there's a lot of parallel processing going on in wireless infrastructure. And the reason is almost everything's done digital nowadays anyway. And so if, if you look at the back end that's supporting one of these cell towers, you're going to see uh, an array of digital signal processors probably teamed up with a, or an array of conventional processors um, <clears throat> all working together to basically understand and route your calls. In some cases, uh, those are even on the same chip, both the DSP and the conventional processor. Um, <clears throat> just like messaging is the main important thing um, that the small talk guy was talking about earlier, um, the, the communication fabric is, is probably has more to say about how your system performs uh, than the processors themselves. So these are some of the communication fabrics out there. By the way, is the term fabric foreign? It's basically you got all these machines wired together, and a lot of times it's on a, like something that looks kind of like a crossbar, and so we got the name fabric. Uh, so these are some of the ones that are out there. Uh, InfiniBand and RapidIO, these are the ones that are, that are open in, in terms of it's an open standard. There are competing companies making chips, um, and they're fast. Um, the first generation of InfiniBand and RapidIO, I think they were both uh, 20 gigabits a second, and that's full duplex. And uh, that's running over four lanes. If you're familiar with PCI Express, you have like, you know, different cards have like maybe four lanes or eight lanes or 16. So a, a four lane uh, infinite band, 20 gigabits a second, full duplex. And that's kind of, that's kind of important, the full duplex thing, because a lot of times your, especially your switch, might be routing traffic in both directions. You got a message from a guy over in this quadrant going to this quadrant and vice versa. You know, maybe different, different actors, for instance. Uh, scalable, coherent interconnect, it's pretty much dead. Uh, it was an IEEE spec. It's interesting mainly because it was sort of groundbreaking in this area. And then there's the proprietary stuff, which you know, unless you want to go out and buy expensive hardware from IBM or someone like that, um, it's not really a factor. Um, so the interesting thing about both InfiniBand and RapidIO, both have very low lat latency. Um, <clears throat> the time from when a message starts arriving until you start receiving it is very short. It doesn't necessarily have to wait for the entire packet to arrive. Um, a packet in RapidIO, for instance, can be 4K, uh, 4K bytes. So it's kind of... Uh, beneficial to be able to look at the header, which is very short in both of these protocols. And by the, by the time I've seen about the 10th byte, I already know what I need to do with this thing. And the rest of it's just gathering the data. Um, deterministic routing. Both of these um, only route like within a local cluster or a local campus. So you're never you don't run rapid IO across the internet to someplace in California from Atlanta. That, that just doesn't happen. But because of that, the routing tables, they're not absolutely static, but they can be, they can be programmed into the switch chips. And so 
there's none of this, you know, hey, let's go call some DNS service to figure out what I need to do with this packet. By looking at the source and the destination IDs, um, I already know. I already know I need to route it to an endpoint that's on my switch, or I need to route it to another switch up the road. Um, <clears throat> I already mentioned small headers. So basically, uh, Ethernet by itself doesn't actually have that bad of a ratio of header to payload. It's when you start adding in all the other TCP IP headers that things start to get messy. Oh. Oh, uh, okay, optimize for message passing. Uh, I'll skip the rest of this, except rapid I.O. is actually on the chip. There are microprocessors that actually have a rapid I.O. port on the chip. So, you know, you don't have to buy a board and plug it into your computer. Uh, so, uh, build your own super computer. By the way, this is a joke. Don't spend a lot of money on, on one of these thinking that you're going to go mine bitcoins and be the next Bill Gates. That, that doesn't work anymore. That train left the station. Uh, <clears throat> this is one that's interesting. Summers actually told me about Parallela. Uh, it's, it's an interesting board because it's basically teams up an ARM processor, which is you know what's in most of your phones these days, uh, an ARM processor to do kind of like general purpose work, and then it's got this grid of 16 or 64 little risk processors that you can assign different work to each one of those. They don't run in lockstep. Each one has its own mind. It's got its own memory. And they communicate with each other relatively fast. Uh, this thing's low cost, 99 bucks for the board. They're sold out right now, but 99 bucks from the, for the board. You can get a complete uh, four-unit cluster with all the extra stuff that it needs uh, for like 5 49 I think. Uh, it's very low power. This thing actually runs off of a wall wart. Yeah. When's the last time you saw a server run off of a wall wart? Um, <coughs> the, the fabric, both internal and off the chip, is 1.5 gigabits a second. That's good. It's not in the same atmosphere. as uh, It's not up in the stratosphere like uh, RapidIO or InfiniBand. Uh, it, it comes with the Ubuntu. It's just, I assume that's running on the ARM and not the... This other chip's called Epiphany, by the way. But anyway, uh, there's a picture of it. And that's about like this big, right? You know, you remember the size of the thing? That's not very big. Well, that, that silver thing that you see right there is a gigabit Ethernet connection. So this thing, this thing is not very big uh, for the Ethernet connector to be that size. Um, let's get that. This is the interesting part of parallel. You've got a grid of all these risk processors. By the way, these are not dumb little, you know, something implemented in like a Gatorade. It's actually got a floating point unit. Um, it can do quite a few gigaflops per each of these little processors. So, pretty cool. Uh, this one is really cheap. And uh, I've actually got one of these here with me. You want to talk about small. I'm not going to pass around because it, I don't want it to get zapped. But that's it. 15 bucks. Um, <clears throat> it will run off of the power that it can get from a micro USB connection. That's how low power it is. And um, <clears throat> it's quite slow compared to Parallela. Uh, I think the interconnects, there's something like, uh, well, it's 400 million transactions a second. I think of transactions only four bits. So, you know, it's, it's slower than Parallela. Let's leave it at that. Uh, this is another version of that they have that's got eight of, of the, actually 16 of the little chips that I just showed you. Each one of these little chips, by the way, has between 8 and 16 virtual cores. I think they're fairly lightweight cores. This is my work that I'm doing in my copious spare time. Uh, call it extreme computing. Uh, 
do a logo, by the way. Everything in this thing is sort of a multiple of eight. It's reason for that look. Um, the chip here, this is a Freescale microprocessor. Um, <clears throat> it's basically a dual-core wrist chip. But it's got this rapid I.O. that we mentioned earlier. So a uh, very fast interface built right on the chip. It's also got a bunch of Ethernet connections. Um, there's the core of the thing. Uh, so basically, each one of these uh, E600 cores, the things in the bluish purple there, uh, is like a one and a half gigabit or gigahertz uh, risk machine. Has a, it's roughly equivalent to the uh, the core that was in the G4. And um, a cluster is just eight of those blades wired together. Uh, the blue stuff, no wait, the, the red stuff is the rapid I.O. And uh, this is the chip that I'm looking at doing another generation. And it is 12 cores. There are 64-bit cores. It has 64-bit floating point. It has the 128-bit AltaVec vector engine. Um, <clears throat> It's also uh, 24 virtual cores, and the way Freescale implemented this, these are fairly heavyweight threads. Almost all the resources are duplicated except uh, the float point unit, the complex integer operations, and I think AltaVec are not duplicated. But if most of your code is integer, it's like it's got 24 cores. Um, each of these Each of these banks here, uh, four cores together, they share an L2K. Is this the last one? 